the control frameworks are powerful because if you use them like paint, paint by numbers, you just start from the beginning and you go one by one. And when someone comes and challenges you on your control and says, hey, that doesn't apply for this other control standard, you can look for kind of the, the commensurate control language and you can talk through kind of your, your mindset and your thought process on why you applied the controls that you applied. This is a Security Weekly production. Security Weekly is a resource of Cyber Risk Alliance. The Cybersecurity Collaborative, in conjunction with Cyber Reason, is proud to present CISO Stories. Each week, CISO Stories takes a deep dive on security leadership. The Cybersecurity Collaborative is a unique membership community enabling cybersecurity leaders to work together in a trusted environment. To learn more, visit securityweekly.com slash CSC. I'm your host, Todd Fitzgerald, and this week we welcome Phil Edka Willey, former CISO at Evalon and Cox Communications. Uh, I started programming in um, middle school. Uh, I was part of the gifted and talented program in my uh, in upstate in a upstate New York school system, and um, I guess they were pretty progressive in the in the early 1980s, and. Um, uh, I started doing um, basic programming in the fifth grade, and um, three years three years later, um, the movie War Games came out, and um, that kind of really kind of piqued my curiosity in the whole information security and the hacking world. And um, six programming languages later, um, co- college degree later, thirty uh, thirty years go by. Here I am, and the information security, cybersecurity industry. Um, professionally, um, I was waiting for, for top secret clearance when I was working for Lockheed Martin, uh, formerly GE Aerospace. And um, when I was waiting for my top secret clearance, it was either uh, stay in a leper farm until I got, got my TSSEI clearance or um, take on um, posted odd jobs that were there available at Lockheed Martin and for GE Capital employees. And um, I lucked out. I there was a job opening for a uh, mainframe security administrator for um, GE Aerospace's MVS and VM mainframes. And um, uh, I happened to get that job. And it started with basically resetting passwords for 400,000 users in the GE network. And um, as they got acquired by Lockheed Martin. And uh, the rest I'll say is history because um, well, shortly after that, I graduated from college and um, e-commerce started in 1993, and that's when I graduated from college. It, it seems to have hit just the right time. And in, in here, I thought when I was in elementary school that we were being very progressive by forming a club called the FBI Club, where we went hunting in the woods for fake criminals. And you're, you're writing computer code in fifth grade. Yeah, the, the, the funny part is... Um, I finally brought it to my house a couple of years ago, but um, probably one of my most memorable pieces of software was, um, so this is like 1980 and, um, you know, choose your own adventure. I don't know if you remember that book series, but um, that book series was kind of in its heyday. And um, so I basically wrote a piece of, I wrote a game that was based around choose your own adventure in Star Trek. And uh, a couple of years ago, I actually, my parents still had it in their house and I brought my um, uh, Franklin Ace 1200, which was an Apple IIe clone. Um, I brought it from New York down here to Atlanta from my parents' house and I, I powered it on. It still works. And my game was, <laughs> my game was still there um, uh, on one of the drives that I had for it. So pretty funny after all these years. Wow. That's, that's, that's very interesting. So, Phil, you wrote a great piece for the CISO Compass book, uh, Navigating Cybersecurity Leadership Challenges with Insights from Pioneers, which you're clearly a pioneer in this space. And uh, you wrote about leveraging control frameworks. Uh, could you walk us through uh, what some of your points in there? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, to, ke- to keep it really simple, and that's hopefully kind of the message I want to give here, is that there have been information security and privacy standards 
that have existed for almost 40 years now. And thousands of people have, from the industry, have participated to collectively codify good practices that should be applied and, um, you know, based off of risk to keep companies safe and to protect data. And um, my point is, you know, people can look at it in two ways. One is um, it's a playbook and it's almost kind of like a playbook of paint by numbers where if you follow along and you apply risk principles to assess priority of which controls to apply, you have a really simple way to um, manage a security program. And, um, you know, what I believe is that security is pretty complex and uh, chief information security officers and security teams need to provide confidence in consistent, repeatable, and measurable security controls to help guide a business and keep them safe. And um, you know, to me, um, you know, another mantra here is that uh, to simplify security to the masses, the, the best types of security for me have always been um, security that's transparent to the user. And um, you know, so I'll stop there. I mean, so to me, it's uh, these security controls, especially for new CISOs or new security teams or teams that want to make sure that they're, they're, they're thorough in how they apply security, um, good security practices. The controls are there as a, as a guide or a blueprint. And, um, you know, something to ask people, hey, are you doing this? Um, is there a risk? Uh, and then you start asking yourself these questions on why aren't I doing this? And, um, you know, it, it becomes a, a very simplistic way to consistently and repeatedly um, implement security controls and then to measure controls and then start benchmarking or comparing how you're doing against others in the industry. I mean, you had a big role in developing the uh, cloud uh, security alliances uh, control matrix. Uh, if I understand correctly, uh, what was that like? Yeah, so I was at Dell at the time, and Michael Dell had just come back to take control of his company um, the year that I had joined. So he was just coming back after being gone for a while. And Michael started buying um, a whole bunch of cloud companies. Um, at the time, they're called application service providers, ASPs, but effectively, they are what today pe most people call cloud service providers. And the short of it was my consulting team was working with the, the product organizations and, that were buying these, um, these, comp these cloud companies, and we were giving them what we believed to be good practices that needed to have enabled for each of these acquired companies. And uh, they weren't really listening <laughs> uh, to us internally. And long story short, in 2008, um, Jim Revis had called me up. He is the founder of the Cloud Security Alliance. And he shared that, you know, roughly 40 people were coming together around the globe in the information security industry and wanted to come up with guiding principles for cloud security. And so the first a product that the Cloud Security Alliance um, provided to the industry was was Cloud Security Guidance Document, which was, you know, a pretty long, thorough um, set of, you know, you should do this type of statements inside of a, a guidance document. Um, I, I turned around and immediately, um, because I'm, I was very familiar with the controls environments. Um, so SAS 70s has a set of controls. Um, SAS 70s were there to provide at the stations at the time since the 1970s on um, security and privacy controls um, to ensure financial transactions in a data center. And so I was kind of familiar with, you know, the SAS 70 at the stations. I was familiar with uh, other control requirements or controls that were out there. And um, I turned around to Jim and I had just left Scientific Atlanta that had acquired, been acquired by Cisco. And, uh, um, and I said, hey, I, I want to build controls specific to cloud, um, but I don't want to reinvent any wheel here. I want to take pre-existing best practices, cloud control practices that are out there and harmonize them um, for cloud. Because if you take a look at cloud, 
versus a single tenant environment, um, aka a, a single company. Um, if you take a single company and you apply that to um, hundreds, thousands of other companies, that would basically be cloud. And so I, I, I basically took the controls that were originally written for a single company and, and rewrote them to be multi-tenant and harmonized them, um, meaning there's a controls language in a security standard like ISO 27001, and there's security controls language in another security control like COBIT um, or NIST 853 um, on the U.S. federal side. But all of them had similar controls language, like your password should be, you know, eight to 12 characters long, alphanumeric, upper, lower case. And what we did was we harmonized them because one standard may, you know, say it's eight characters long. Another standard may say it needs to be 10 or another may say it's 12. One may say alphanumeric. One may say it expires within 45 days. And what we did was we, we aligned them so people could see what the differences between the different security controls. Um, and harmonize them by saying, "Hey, here's kind of like the base set of principles required." So, so do you take them. the most? Do you take the most restrictive of those, or how do you how do you actually harmonize them when they're coming in as different? So, you know, risk management is the glue for security controls. When you when you understand kind of what your risk tolerance is and what your risk profile is for your company. It's, it becomes much easier to say, hey, we're going to be much more stringent with our security controls or we're going to be much looser. And, uh, and so my, my best answer for you is it's really based off of the risk tolerance of a company, whether to apply a specific control more stringently or much looser or a whole set of them uh, much looser or much stronger. And how do you deal with, uh, so an auditor comes in and they're looking at these different control standards and how do you, how do you decide that, okay, I want to change it every 45 days or 90 days, or I only want, you know, eight character passwords and, and, you know, somebody else wants 14. Uh, how do I, you know, how do I come up with that defense for my auditors? So there's, there's there's different kind of auditors that are out there, right? Some are some are there from a regulatory perspective, and you know I'm 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 just coming from the banking industry and the payments um, payments and fintech industries, and so the regulators there tend to be much more prescriptive because they have their own guidelines um, and requirements for how you behave inside those verticals vertical industries. And there are other types of auditors that are there specifically, like, like for example, ISO 27001. It's what you put on paper yourself, and it's based off of the risk that you identify is how they assess you. So, you know, so in the spectrum of things, there are auditors that are there to hold you accountable for what you say you're going to do. And then there's other type of auditors that are there that are hold you accountable based off of what their requirements are based off of whatever law or regulation that they're there to audit you against. And then you're same with your own internal audit teams. And so, so there's, there's a couple steps that you need to take. One is, again, it's all based off of risk. And I think if you can talk to any of them on kind of your risk, uh, the risk to your company and how you're managing it, I think all of them kind of, they, 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 um, they cut you a break that they, that, and they know that your understanding of your environment, that's one. Mm -hmm. And then the other one too is being able to articulate that risk to them um, in practical terms, and um, you know, so I think I think those two are kind of very important for again how being able to uh, um, say how stringent your your controls will be. The article this podcast is based upon can be viewed in the best-selling cybersecurity leadership book CISO Compass. Navigating Cybersecurity Leadership Challenges with Insights from Pioneers, available at Amazon.com and other booksellers. I guess one thing I like about the controls matrix, and I always point people to this, is if you're trying to do some sort of a mapping between all the different standards, it's already been done for you in, in the controls matrix. Uh, Jim Rivas, uh, we we had him on as a as a guest on on the CISO Stories podcast uh, previously as well. That's out there if people want to listen to that. 
Um, and I first met uh, Jim actually right around the time uh, that that you were talking about the you know the 2008 kind of time frame. And I remember I was I was at a conference. Uh, and we were we were having a, a dinner planning meeting for the conference, and Jim asked me if I would be on the on the panel for for implementing in the cloud. And at that time, I said, "Well, I I I don't think I should be on that panel I, because I was thinking, you know, what sort of experience did I really have in implementing in the cloud? And I, I tend to make it a practice not to give presentations about things I don't know a lot about." <laughs> I think that's uh, usually a good policy, and um, and and what I discovered a few years later is that there was really nobody at that time that really had any real experience in implementing in the cloud. It was still at that you know theoretical uh, type state, or except for some of the you know the major players, but uh, companies there wasn't a lot of experience at that time. Yeah, I was I was kind of thrown into the fire, so it was because of um, necessity. I, I was thinking about it already because, again, when I was at Dell, um, you know, Michael Dell had already by two thousand eight had acquired six companies for just under ten billion dollars uh, that were all cloud providers. And long story short, you know, the feedback to him was when we put the Dell logo on top of this. You know, security is one of the top three reasons why people are going to use this or not use this, and it's it's a big it's a problem. And again, internal teams weren't really listening to us. My consulting organization, they weren't listening to them. Today, they'd probably be called business information security officers, but they weren't being listened to. And so, I thought it was a fantastic opportunity to apply those principles out into the industry and push them back into Dell. To make sure Dell was, you know, as customers were asking us, "Hey, are you doing, you know, um, you know, the, fill out this uh, a worksheet on supply chain security?" So I was already seeing that in 2007, 2008. Tell us about your supply chain security, and they'd give me questionnaires with like 500 to 800 questions. I mean, ridiculous um, complexity. And so the guy, the guide, the guideline from the CSA was helpful trying to answer stuff because we could anticipate questions. But I figured a controls matrix was a better way to go. And, um, you know, another dimension I didn't share was the controls matrix was easy to build because, you know, you, you, you know, philosophically, you know, you're, most of the controls were written um, historically. So at that time with 20 years, you know, 25 years in the making um, with COBIT and COSO and, um, but they were written for individual companies. Okay. And at the time, you know, it struck me that, what if we wrote this against a multi-tenant environment? So like a condominium. So if you take the security controls and instead of thinking you're like in a single family home, apply that like you're living in a condominium, which, right, there's a whole bunch of um, homes within the bigger home, condos within the bigger condominium complex. How do you apply shared services within that and provide a level of security for each inhabitant? And that's the, that's the only modifications we made when it came to the cloud controls matrix from the cloud security alliance because it allowed us to think kind of more broadly and say, okay, so in a multi-tenant environment, how does this change? And which one of these are most are more important? Like you can't, you, everybody has to have a different key to their door. So that's user ID and password, right? And so it, it like uh, it shifted our mentality and allowed us to again think more broadly. And interestingly enough, to see it, the the cloud controls matrix to me like. If you just want to apply that to a single company, the CSA, the, the control matrix um, um, rolls back into an individual company again. So, so I'm going to actually fast forward. I know um, as we're talking here, um, so in 2013, the President Obama put out Executive Order 13636, and which was kind of the U.S.'s first foray into cybersecurity um, good practices for critical infrastructure. and I thought it was the kind of the same problem trying to be solved. And instead of, um, you know, a multi-tenant cloud environment, so on the entire internet, how do we ensure um, all the different critical infrastructure has a level of cybersecurity good practices to employ? And um, I, I actually, during, in 2013, offered um, the federal government uh, that um, to, to take, to adopt the, 
CSA cloud controls matrix because I already thought the blueprint was there. I mean, ultimately they didn't. But what's interesting is that the um, the National Institute of Standards and Technologies NIST they they used almost a similar approach because if you look at kind of the version one of the NIST cybersecurity framework, um, it's very much the same thing. It had you know uh, general um, topical areas um, followed by subcategories. And each of those subcategories mapped into pre-existing controls. And what NIST did was instead of taking, at the time we started with like 13 controls at the CSA, they, um, they took five of the most prominent um, cybersecurity standards used in the United States mm -hmm. and harmonized those to uh, complete their matrix. So what do you what do you think? I mean, you've you've worked with these fifteen or so different uh, control frameworks, and I know in in writing the the CISO Compass book, I, the section I the chapter I wrote on control frameworks, I, I got to thirteen of them, and 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 I got tired of writing about control frameworks. <laughs> you know, it was it, because they were they're so repetitive, and they and they and they handle similar things but in different ways and with a different focus and and which ones do you think are are, are the ones that you gravitate to the most so you know so this is actually a religious area in our industry it's been one for some time i mean if you talk to federal folks it's you know things um, produced by nist if you talk to um you know folks that have kind of international operations iso tends to be the standards that are selected. If you're kind of in a regulated environment in the banking space, there's again, a wide variety of, of those standards that are there. So the best answer I can give you is it depends on the space that you're in. You know, if you're transacting credit cards, payment card industry, the PCI standards are kind of the, the Bible um, for people that transact credit cards. If you're in healthcare, right? HIPAA is there um, and, and high trust. So, you know, I think it depends on kind of the industry that you're in. Um, what I've noticed is people that are in um, unregulated or kind of much looser spaces, or they don't really have kind of the whole audit mentality. A lot of the folks um, at the time, it was from SANS, um, and then it kind of shifted to the CSC folks. But the, you know, SANS 20, the CSC 20 is kind of the another big one that people implement. And uh, frankly, it's... Um, I found over and over again, it's very uh, religious. It's a, it's whatever religion you decided, um, especially in kind of the un, unregulated space that you're going to apply. Yeah, I kind of like the, you've got the NIST and COBIT for the, the top level things. And you have the, you know, if you're starting with an infrastructure type project, you have the, you know, the SANS or the CIS con, uh, critical controls. And if you're looking at a process orientation, you've got ISO. So you can kind of pick and choose. Do you, do you think, you know, there's always been this discussion. I mean, we've had these control frameworks around for, for quite a while. Um, do you, do you think we're ever going to see that day where we really get down to uh, one base standard framework and that the, that the auditors are looking at that framework because companies are spending a lot of time and money trying to, trying to map and trying to make sure that they're compliant with all these different frameworks? Um, you, you know, Again, being a, in a religious area, I, I, I doubt it. And, um, but, you know, I think there are a lot of different efforts that are out there to harmonize standards, um, to apply, um, to determine kind of repeatable standards that are out there. I, I, you know, I, to kind of give like another analogy, like, you know, I believe our industry, it's, it's kind of like the racing industry, you know, and what I tell people is like, a, you know, brakes, um, brakes help race cars go faster. You know, a lot, of, a lot of executives look at me like, what are you talking about? I'm like, well, the, the brakes aren't actually there to stop a car. It's actually to make a race car go faster because there's a concept in racing called the racing line. And it's basically like a, it's a, it's the route where a race driver follows to take corners faster. And it basically allows cars to travel in a straighter line. And that therefore allows cars to travel faster um, before it loses control um, or grip. And, um, you know, the, to me, there are four principles in kind of how that race line works. And um, braking is actually like one of those um, mechanism factors in, in, the, in creating a good race line, when to, when to brake 
and then there's a, it's called the turn point and the turn in point and the next is an apex and um and then you know lastly is kind of the position the direction of the next corner and it's again cr- trying to create this straight line and I, I use this analogy because uh it's the same thing with us like it, you know there, there are basic principles that we should all adopt and just like with ra- you know race car drivers there are very basic principles when you break everything down to its you know bare bare essentials or simplify everything and like i said earlier right simplicity is kind of like the best type of security mm-hmm. um I think con- applying controls and then being able to navigate um, uh, controls and being able to talk to other people on how one control and another control are close and to talk about the risk in your situation, to be able to talk them off the the fence. If they're saying, Hey, you're not applying more stringent controls or in my instance, like I'm willing to take a regulator right up. If they want me to apply even more stringent controls, they know, they know kind of the thought process of what, why we, applied certain control practices and made the investments that we've made. And they know that um, I'm, you know, I'm diligently and thoughtfully applying controls across my entire environment to keep, keep the companies I'm at safe. I, I, I think that's really good advice. And uh, I'm a big fan of, uh, I go to one car race a year. I go to the Indy 500 every year and have for almost two decades now. And uh, I'm just glad they have brakes uh, so that they're able to to slow down when they need to. So I, I think that's a great, great analogy. Um, so this has been great, Phil. And, uh, you know, is there any, um, uh, Phil, what, what sort of advice would you like to leave our listeners with as they're working with these uh, control frameworks? So, you know, so I started that, um, you know, I think if people look at these control frameworks as kind of a, a paint by numbers cheat sheet, I think it's a great way. I think just if they pick up any any control framework or, you know, if there's one that they have to apply to, like the payment card industry, if they're, again, transacting credit cards, if they pick up almost any of these control frameworks and, and treat them as a paint by numbers where it says, do number one, do number two, th- there's a reason why like in the NIST cybersecurity framework, right? I mean, AM-1.1, which is the first control that's called out, it's know your assets, it's asset management. Because um, you know, what what I what I particularly like with a lot of these control frameworks are, you know, they they put kind of the important stuff first. So just follow along. And if you apply kind of a risk mentality, you know, you start asking yourself, hey, how you know, what's the risk here? Right? What's the what's the probable likelihood of compromise? Or, and what's what's the um, you know what's the probability and um, impact um, of this, and that that kind of gives you a basic sense of your risk. I mean, there's a bunch of different risk standards that are out there as well, risk management frameworks to follow. But um, the control frameworks are powerful because if you use them like paint, paint by numbers, you just start from the beginning and you go one by one. And when someone comes and challenges you on your control and says, "Hey, that doesn't apply for this other control standard." You can look for kind of the the commensurate control language, and you can talk through kind of your your mindset and your thought processes on why you applied the controls that you applied. And I think the good part is like, um, you know, our industry for, geez, the better part of the last like ten years, we've been talking about there's not enough people in cybersecurity, right? And so mm-hmm. there's going to be a lot. There's going to be millions of new people coming into our industry and these control frameworks are just a, a fantastic blueprint just to get acquainted with yeah. the wide variety of security controls that need to be applied through one's career. I, and, I, uh, I really like that insight because I think it, we, we all, sometimes people in the industry that have been in the industry for a while think, well, don't we already know this stuff? And we, we always have to have that in our mind that we have new people coming in that, um, that 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 need to see the larger picture and the control frameworks help us do that. Yeah. I mean, if I could leave one thing and it's, it's probably more on the advanced side, but um, in my time um, at Elevon and U S bank, I was actually developing a strategy, um, a, a framework um, called the risk cube. And basically if you kind of like, if you look at everything in front of you that you're trying to protect as a bunch of um, cubes, right? Meaning um, here's a control that's required and it's based off of like an IP address or an asset, right? So on the X axis, you have an asset and the Y axis, you have kind of the control, 
right? Um, on the z-axis, you can actually kind of state um, uh, location if you want, or on the z and or on the z-axis, you can kind of um, select as kind of the control standard that you're using. So three-dimensionally, what you're doing is you're building rooms of cubes, buildings of cubes, communities of cubes, where you're trying to fill each cube. And when you first start, you're throwing basically like basketballs inside of these cubic boxes or rectangles or whatever shape of these cube farms, these control farms you're looking at. And, um, you know, the, the more that you you assess where you're at and you, you fine tune what, where you've applied controls or haven't applied controls, you start throwing in like baseballs, then golf balls, sand, then water. The, the risk cube philosophy that I started implementing at Elevon was the intention was, hey, let's take all of the controls that are out there and try to try to fill in all the gaps Let's, let's throw in basketballs in there to see just how are we doing. So by the time you kind of look up, you can see, hey, we've looked over here. We've looked at a lot of stuff. We have a lot of fine-grained, detailed knowledge on our controls language capabilities in the space. But if I look over there, we have no coverage. Why don't we have anything over there? And so it gives you this like big visibility, and you can put it inside of an enterprise risk management, um, uh, enterprise risk management tool like like an Archer. And, uh, you know, you, when you take a couple of steps back, you realize, hey, we have a lot of controlled knowledge over here. And here's all the gap. Here's the gaps that we have. And then the more that you look for smaller grained or smaller uh, density um, um, fillers for each control, like by the time you throw in water, for example, into that, um, that bucket, you realize like, hey, there's, a, there's big gaps that we have in the, these areas and we need to fill in more to have a better understanding. Because at the end of the day, like, the, um, the, the reason why chief information security officers get get fired is because mostly because things they don't know. And, um, you know, and, and sometimes it's it, things they do know. Right. But I, I'm in the caliber of CISO that I would rather uncover, uh, turn over every rock and have a better understanding of it. And again, thoughtfully digest. Yeah. Um, what security needs to be applied and kind of this risk cube mentality. I can probably write a whole book on it, um, I, but I, it's. You know, I think that's how a, do you how do you look at everything in aggregate and really thoroughly have a sense of how good you're doing and not doing? I, I think that's a great concept. And well, Phil, um, I know you're a busy guy. Thanks for the time that that you took with us today, and thanks for all that you do in the industry. Thanks a lot, Todd. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Cyber Reason is the champion for today's defenders providing an endpoint security platform to prevent, detect, and respond to malicious operations on computers, mobile devices, servers, and the cloud. Cyber Reason, end cyber attacks from endpoints to the enterprise to everywhere. Learn more at cyberreason.com slash CISO stories.